Well, hey, as we get started today, I want to say welcome, welcome back to our 40 days through the book. Our 40 days through the book study that we are doing on the book that we call in the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles. And we began that study last week, and uh, we're going to continue that this morning. And for the next six weeks, we as a church family are going on an in-depth exploration of the disciple Luke's message to followers of Jesus in the church. And we're going to be looking at six key themes uh, these next weeks, Uh, themes that tell us the story of the early church and the revolution of faith, the revolution of faith that happened throughout the Roman Empire. And, uh, and Luke, as we talked about last week, began by telling uh, the story uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke, where he tells about Jesus' birth and his life and his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven. And then as we saw last week when we looked at Acts chapter 1, the second part of that story begins in the Acts of the Apostles, where he starts with Jesus' final words to his followers before he goes back to heaven to be his witnesses, and then he ascends into heaven. And we talked last week about, and we're going to talk in these next weeks about how when God's people live in the way that God calls us to, when we love our neighbor as ourselves, when we live for God's glory, when we bless others around us, when we are a witness to them, when we live into his final instructions, we're going to see that what happened back then was a revolution of faith that swept across the empire and swept across the Roman world. And As we learn, our hope and our desire and our prayer is that as we learn from the early followers of Jesus, as we look through the book of Acts, that we too will be able to be part of a revolution of faith that God is doing in our world today, that God is even doing here within our own nation. And so I want to encourage you this morning, as I did last week, if you've not picked up the Bible study guides that we're going to be using uh, throughout these six weeks, starting today, would you stop by the table out there the, uh, in the welcome, uh, in the foyer area, the welcome table, and, uh, and would you pick up one of these? If you don't have the money to pay for that today, that's okay. If you don't have the money at all to pay for it, to pick one up. And uh, we would love to get this into your hands. Our small groups, a lot of them are using this study through the next weeks. And uh, in it as well, there are daily devotionals that will take us through, uh, progressively through the book of Acts, through the next 40 days. We're going to study and be in depth together as a church family in the book of Acts. And, uh, and so last week, as we began in Acts 1, we want to pick the story up this morning in Acts chapter 2. The story of the birth of the church, the beginning of this revolution that God has put across the world, this revolution of faith. And so this morning I want to read to us Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, and I invite us to stand out of reverence for the reading of God's word. This is what Luke writes. On the day of Pentecost... All the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, People from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, ah, they're just drunk. That's all. 
And then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. (laughs) No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Your sons and daughters, your old men will dream dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above the, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. And the sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. May God add his blessing and his understanding today to this reading of his holy word. You may be seated. Come with me to the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem where where this happened some 2,000 years ago. It was the time of the wheat harvest there in that place, and and it was the festival that in Hebrew, the Hebrew people call it Shavuot, And, and it means weeks. We in the Greek culture or from Greek learning call it Pentecost. That is the name of the feast that we know it by. Hebrew, it's Shavuot, Pentecost in the Greek. And, 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 and Pentecost is from the number 50. In other words, it occurs 50 days after Passover. Passover, that first feast in the Jewish religious calendar. And, and Jerusalem is filled with people at this time, filled with people, Josephus, the Jewish historian, says as much as as many as two million people in this city at that time because it was one of the three Jewish festivals where God said he wanted all Jewish male adults to go to the house of God to worship him. And can I tell you, Jesus' followers are pumped. They are excited. They are filled with expectation, wondering what God is going to do that day. Because you see, Ten days earlier, as we saw last week in chapter 1, Jesus had ascended into heaven. And remember, he had told them to go to Jerusalem, to stay there, and wait until he sent to them the gift of his Holy Spirit. And that once that happened, they were then to go out into the world and be his witnesses there in their hometown of Jerusalem, in their own county in Judea, uh, to people in their area who are of another culture and ethnic group, the Samaritans, and then to go out into the world wherever they are and be his witnesses. And so they know something coming. They don't know what all that means to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus has said he's going to do that, and they know something is coming. And, and, and they've seen the progression of all the events over the last 50 days. I mean, think about it. By way of background to help us understand why they're so excited, think about how 50 days earlier they had been celebrating Passover, expecting that they were going to celebrate Passover in the way they had every year of their life. Celebrating that 1,400 years before then, the people of Israel had sprinkled the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the doorposts of their homes. And that night, when the angel of death came through Egypt in that tenth plague, God spared his people from death if they had the blood of the sacrificial lamb over their doorposts. And as a result of that plague, Pharaoh finally frees them and, uh, from slavery in Egypt and Passover is a celebration of all of that. And on that Passover day... 50 days before what we are reading here in Acts 2, Jesus, the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, became the spiritual Passover lamb for them and for you and for me and all people who would trust in him and receive his forgiveness and grace and mercy. Jesus died as a fulfillment of the Passover. And then the next day, they're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what was the Feast of Unleavened Bread? It was the feast where God's people would celebrate the seed that was planted into the ground that would bring forth the grain that offered bread that would give physical life. And that year, on that Feast of Unleavened Bread, Jesus, 
who the Bible calls the bread of life, was planted into the ground in a sense. He's buried. And then the next feast right after that is called the Feast of First Fruits. And that feast celebrates the harvest being taken out of the ground. That harvest, the first of the grains that were harvested in that region of the world was the barley harvest. And, and, and it was food that offered them life. And on that day, as the Jewish people were celebrating the Feast of First Fruits, Jesus was raised from the dead, as the Bible says, the first of all who will be raised from the dead. And who will get to be with God in heaven when we trust him in faith. And, and, and so all of this is, is going on. And these disciples see this happening. And so think about it. Uh, that year, those three feasts are back to back to back. Something that didn't normally happen. It only happened once in a great while as, as a calendar just happened to line up as to where Passover fell for that to happen. And what that is saying to them is that God has orchestrated the timing of all of this. Jesus' death and burial and, and resurrection coinciding with these feasts. He dies on Passover. He's buried on, uh, 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 on the unleavened bread feast. He rises on first fruits. And then what happens 40 days later? What happens 40 days later is that after uh, Jesus is resurrected, he goes to the mountain and he goes up on the mountain and he ascends and he meets with God. And they're making the connection of what had happened 1,400 years before that. Because what happens, if you know the scripture, you know that, that the Bible teaches us and tells us that, that when the Jewish people left Egypt and came out of slavery, they went out into the desert and they traveled 40 days to Mount Sinai. And when they get to Mount Sinai, Moses goes up on the mountain and meets with God. And as Moses is up on the mountain, the scripture tells us that all around the mountain, there comes fire and smoke and wind and thunder. And it's interesting that, I don't know if you know this, the Hebrew word koloth is the word that they translate for thunder, but it's also the word that they translate languages. Same word can mean thunder and it can mean languages. And there on the mountain, some 1,400 years before, as Moses has ascended up and meeting with God, God gives him the word of God, the Torah, the law of God. And when Moses comes down from the mountain several days later, it's around the time when the wheat harvest happens. And, and so he is bringing down to them the word of God. Is it any wonder then why Deuteronomy says, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds or comes from the mouth of God. So, so Jesus' followers, by way of background, are connecting all of these dots, all of these things that have happened over the last 50 days. And they come now to Shavuot, to the celebration of the wheat harvest, to the celebration of Pentecost, and they realize that what has been happening is not a coincidence. And they're just, they're like pumped. <laughs> they're expecting that something amazing is going to happen. And they, for the last 10 days, have been gathering at the temple where we see the next picture coming up. This is a model of the temple, which, by the way, in that day was the largest religious enclosure building of, in the world at that point. Covered, covered 36 acres. The Temple Mount covered 36 acres. And they have been there the last 10 days, every day praising God, meeting with God, because that is the temple, the house of God, the place where Jewish people say that God resides in his presence. Now, now, if you know the history of the Old Testament, you know that God's presence originally was with his people in that portable tabernacle that Moses had built out in the desert. And then when the people came to the promised land, they came and they built Solomon's temple. And, and in 2 Chronicles 7, it talks about how when Solomon finished praying the prayer of dedication over the temple, fire and smoke and thunder came down on the temple and burned up the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glorious presence of God, the scripture says, filled the temple. 
And so Jewish people knew that this was the place where God resided. Now they knew that he could reside anywhere, that his presence was everywhere. They understood that, but they knew he could localize his presence. And they would say that this was the place where God lived. This was where his presence was, with us and with his people. They believed that God lived inside that building in the form of God's glory. And they call it the house. We call it the temple. Understand that Jewish people would never call, and they still do not call that the temple today. They call it the house. Temple to them is a pagan word. It's a, it's a Greek word. And, and so they call that the house. They don't even call the temple mount the temple mount. They call it the mountain of the house. And so with this understanding of what they are seeing going on and how they view God's presence being there with them, there at the house, with that background in mind, let's go back to the events that we read about just a few moments ago from Acts chapter 2. The disciples are there in Jerusalem. They've been there for the last 10 days, following Jesus' instructions, and they've been gathering every day at the temple. And we read in Acts 2 that that they are in a house. Now, it's interesting to me that in our translations, some of our translations even say the upper room. Can I tell you that is not the correct translation? The upper room never appears in the original Greek. The only thing that appears in the Greek is the word house. And, and the word house is the same for the house that people live in and also the house of God. It tells us that they are in the house. And given the context that every Jewish male is supposed to be at the temple on the day of Pentecost at nine o'clock in the morning for when the events start, can I tell us that Jewish scholars believe that the disciples were not in a house like we know it, but they were at the house. They were there along with all other Jewish males ready to celebrate Pentecost. And, and as they are there, it's nine o'clock in the morning and it's time for the sacrifice to be made. And, and as happened there in that day, uh, every year the priest with the best Levitical, the Levitical priest with the best voice would stand and they would read the same scriptures every year at the feast of Pentecost or Shavuot. And so there that day, the priest did what he did every year. And he turned to Exodus. And he read how God came down on Mount Sinai in smoke and in fire and thunder. And the mountain shook. And then he read from Ezekiel how God's glory filled the house. And in the house, there was the sound of wind and fire. And as he read, you can bet everybody was spellbound to feel the time when God came down from heaven on his house. And as they're celebrating that and reading about what took place 1,400 years before out in the desert on Mount Sinai with God coming down on Mount Sinai and fire and smoke and wind and thunder giving the word of God to Moses... All of a sudden, Acts 2 tells us the sound of wind filled the house and fire appeared. And the people just had to be looking around proclaiming, it's happening again, just as it has happened in the past. And the scripture tells us, Luke tells us how tongues of fire came on the followers of Jesus as fire came down. And as it did, Peter and his disciples began to what? Speak in many thunders. Speak in many languages. As filled with the Spirit, they began to speak in languages they did not know so that those around them could hear the good news of Jesus. Jesus and of God's grace, and God's mercy, and God's forgiveness, and the relationship that God wants to have with all people, if they will trust him in faith and believe in him. 
And as the followers of Jesus shared the good news about Jesus and were a witness of Jesus to others, the Bible tells us that 3,000 people that day, 3,000 people trusted Christ in faith. And it was the birth of the Christian church. And I don't know if you understand this, but that number 3,000 is an interesting number. Because if you go back and you look at what happened on that anniversary day, back when it originally happened, and Moses came down off of Mount Sinai, those of you who know that story, what did he come down from Mount Sinai from to see the people doing? Worshiping the golden calf, that's right. They had set up an idol and were worshiping the golden calf. And Moses, it says, broke the tablets. And then it says that God swept through the camp. And a number of people were put to death, including the leaders of having done that. And do you know how many people are listed in there in the Old Testament as having died that day? 3,000. 3,000. And that's why the Apostle Paul later on talks about how the law brings death but the Spirit of God brings life. And the Spirit of God brings life to you and me when we trust him in forgiveness and faith and to people out there in the world around us who need to know. And that was the day when God changed residence. God changed his address. When he moved, when God came down and it was localizing his presence among his people, he began first in a tent in a tabernacle in the wilderness. And then he moved into the limestone building in Solomon's temple. And then the marble one, Herod's temple. God lived there. And all of a sudden, as God's people are celebrating God's presence, having come down on his people there during the wheat harvest, fire comes down and wind comes down. And he moves into a new temple. Do you remember how when Jesus was crucified, at the moment when he died, the scripture tells us that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And it was done in that way because it could not have been done at all by human hands because of the height of a building like that. But, but God's people... In other words, are no longer separated as a result of that. That was an image that God was saying, you are no longer separated from my presence. You can walk into the Holy of Holies and stand in the presence of God without the need of the high Jewish Levitical priest. But it's interesting that our Jewish friends say that we Christians have missed the other half of that. We talk all the time about how the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom so that because God, God wanted us to be able to come into his presence. But the Jewish people will tell us that happened because God didn't want to live there anymore. And he has a new house. And his new house is not the temple, but his new house now is you and me. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones in whom God dwells through the power of his Holy Spirit. And we saw that a few weeks ago in our series on a new kind of community as we looked at Ephesians 2.22 that says, in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. And 1 Peter 2 says, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Where does God live? He lives in in us. And several weeks ago, we looked at a number of the implications of that for your life and mine, particularly as it relates to us living together in community and not being individuals as followers of Jesus, but being together as the church of Jesus Christ. But this morning as we close, uh, before we close, I, I want to take a few moments to, to talk about what are some of the implications of this in relation to what Acts is telling us and what we're going to see over these next six weeks as we do our devotions uh, each day in the book of Acts. And what we're going to see, the implication of this, is, is that God's, the implication of us being God's temple is that now churches, God's people, are Holy Spirit-infused living organisms that are dynamic and alive and changing the world around us.
as we are part of the revolution of faith that God is doing in the world. We who are the church, the spiritual temple in whom God lives, when we live as Jesus calls us to, we get to be part of the revolution of faith that he is doing. What an exciting thing that is. You know, so many people see the church as this human-led organization that holds worship services, that asks for offerings, right? That's the stereotype out there. That marries and buries people. But the truth is that the church is a global movement that is growing and expanding and fulfilling the mission that Jesus called us to fulfill 2,000 years ago. The church is not a remnant of the past, which is going to soon disappear into the rearview mirror of history. God sees his church as being people like you and me and his people throughout all times who who he is transforming our lives into being more into his likeness and then we can go out and be the people he calls us to be. I mean, think about it. Isn't it kind of crazy that that all of this began with an obscure, marginalized rabbi in Galilee, an obscure, marginalized part of the world, with, uh, what, um, 19 followers, 12 men and, and 7 women who were his disciples, who were also obscure and marginalized people, and, and, and then the early church had no power politically, were mostly poor people, obscure and marginalized. And God creates a movement that went from 19 to a couple hundred who were gathered there on the day of Pentecost, followers of Jesus, to over 3,000 people on that first day. And by the year 350 AD, 33 million people professed to be followers of Jesus. 56% of the Western world were followers of Jesus by 350 AD. And that revolution that God began with Jesus sending his son into the world continues today and around the globe. And we are going to see that as we read the book of Acts and we see how it applies to us. Because as you and I live our life and live into our vision statement as a church of becoming more like Jesus together, and we live into our mission statement of growing together in our relationship with Jesus and growing together in our relationship with each other and then growing together in our ministry out in the world, we're going to get to be part of this revolution of faith that God is doing. And we need to be a part of seeing what God does in people's lives. And the early church showed that. As let me read to us the last part of chapter 2. The last part of Acts chapter 2. You can follow as it comes up on the screen behind me. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. In other words, they devoted themselves to growing together in their relationship with Jesus. And then watch how they devoted themselves to growing together in their relationship with each other and in ministry to the world around them. Verse 43. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And what was the result? Each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. They blessed others as we've talked about. They prayed for others. They came alongside others. They listened to their needs and their concerns. They ministered to them. They served with them. And and they shared the story of good news. 
And, and, and God's church grew. This revolution of faith went on throughout their communities and out into the empire as people invited others into their homes and into their small churches, home churches, and into their small groups. And they loved them, and they cared for them, and they ministered to them. They, they lived what it meant to be Pentecost people as they were a blessing to others. It's interesting to me that so many in the Christian church today will say, hey, the sign of being a Pentecost person is the sign of speaking in tongues. You've got to speak in tongues if you are going to truly be a Pentecost person and experience the full blessing of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you that's not what the Scripture tells us? Actually, the sign of being God's people and being filled with the Spirit is being filled with the fruits of the Spirit, but it is also then out of the overflow of that being willing to bless others. If we had the opportunity to go back and study the text from Leviticus 23 and God's giving the instructions for what they were to do on this Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost, we would see just a couple of verses that I'll share with you. In Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 15, it says, from the day after the Sabbath, the day that you bring the bundle of grain to be lifted up as a special offering, that's the Feast of of First Fruits, that's the barley harvest, the first of the harvest, count off seven weeks, keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days, and then present an offering of the new grain to the Lord, the wheat. You see, the barley grew before the wheat. So the barley was presented at first fruits, the wheat at Pentecost or Shavuot. But listen to what he says is a sign that they are truly Pentecost people. Verse 22. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields. And do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and for the foreigners living among you. For I am the Lord your God. The sign that we are God's people and the sign that you and I can be part of this revolution of faith that God wants to do through us and that we're going to learn more and more about as we read Acts. The sign of that is that we are filled with the fruits of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control and we are going to be out there in our world blessing others with them. And we are going to be generous people. As we abide with Jesus, as John 14 tells us, and 15, and as we walk in his spirit, as Galatians 5 speaks of, and we will be people who God will use to be part of the revolution of faith that he wants to do. In closing, I want to share with us an illustration about popcorn, of all things. Found this out a while ago. Didn't know this before. Fascinated me. Um, you ever wonder what makes popcorn pop? You know, I mean, think about it. What, what is it that causes this transformation? Well, no, yeah, that's what I thought was air, but it's not. Inside of every kernel of popcorn is a little dot of water. And it's a microscopic kind of dot. And it's on the inside of the kernel. And so when you heat up the kernel, you are heating up the water that is inside. And as that water expands, it creates steam and pressure. And the popcorn pops into what it becomes. Not necessarily because you heated up the shell. You love that, Jelena, don't you? It's great. Yeah, we're learning something new. I learned this a little bit ago. But if I could put a spiritual overlay on this for us this morning, think about us as being that kernel. But inside of us is living water. Jesus Christ, through the power of his Holy Spirit. And if we will focus on heating up that part of our life and we will spend time regularly in God's word and in prayer and in fellowshipping with each other, watch out what happens. <laughs> because we are going to be transformed into the kind of people who God wants us to be. 
You see, God has a whole host of people out here in Johnson County and in the Kansas City region. And wherever it is that you find yourself, if you are a business person who travels around the world, he has a whole host of people in the world who he wants to see his smile. Who he wants to feel his compassionate heart. Who he wants to experience his generous nature. Who he wants to be impacted by his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. And you know, he could have come down to earth with all kinds of miraculous signs that would amaze people and blow their hair back. But instead he chose to dwell within you and in me and in the community of his people. So that when people out there in the world, in Johnson County, in the Kansas City region, or wherever it is you find yourself, rub shoulders with you and with me, they are really rubbing shoulders with the living God who loves them and who dwells inside of us because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize it tomorrow? Do you realize that tomorrow we are the closest things that, that, that many people are ever going to get to experiencing God? And so when they experience us, what will they think? What will they think of Jesus? How will they judge our God? They will think about Jesus and they will judge our God by what they think about you and me and how they judge us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We, the baptized, have experienced his grace and his forgiveness. And God calls you and me to be part of the revolution of faith that he is doing here in our community and around the United States, and in our world.